We're grateful for his breath in our lungs. Today, our message is in John chapter 12, and the title of the message is, Sir, We Want to See Jesus. Now, I know it's Palm Sunday, (laughs) and usually we do the have some type of Palm Sunday procedure going into going into Jerusalem, and that is included in this text, but there's more to it than, I think, what meets the eye. So, sirs, we would see Jesus. One of the things we would um, like to make mention of is that if you have an offering that you would like to send, please send it to Winber Assembly, Box 361, Winber, Pennsylvania, 15963, and make those checks out to Winber Assembly. So uh, keep that in mind, Box 360. 361. Um, Sirs, we would see Jesus. Now, whenever we think about seeing, the, it's more than just looking at. You know, we want, we want to be able to see or look at him, have a conference with him. Well, <clears throat> it really implies, sirs, we want to have a revelation of Jesus. We want Jesus to be revealed to our hearts and lives, to us. And so as we think about this um, revelation, wanting to see Jesus, we, we start out in, in John chapter 12 at verse 1, six days before Passover. Well, it's interesting as I, you start to break this down and look at some of the, the text and what, what it's implying, six days before Passover was a very meaningful time. This was the time in which the families or uh, the, the father would go out and pick the lamb that was to be used in the sacrifice and bring that lamb into the home. And that lamb would stay in the home with the family for the six days. And during that time, they would make sure that it didn't have any blemishes or wasn't bruised or hurt in any way. And one of the most familiar places that a a lamb or an animal could be hurt was in its hoof or its ankles. I, and I didn't realize this. And so it would be common for the family to anoint, take oil and put on the, the hoof or the uh, ankle part, as it were, of the animal to keep it or to heal it, you know, to keep it, to get it strong. So, and also six days before Passover was a time in which devout men would set themselves apart to prepare themselves for Passover for them to eat the lamb that they would sacrifice. And we know that the Passover meal comes from when the children of Israel were in Egypt and the, the last plague that was brought upon the Egyptians for the children of Israel to leave the Egyptian bondage was the death of the firstborn. And what happened, Moses gave them the command, you take a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost of your home, and the angel of death will pass over your home. And so when we think of Jesus Christ, as we go through this process that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we understand that his blood was shed for the remission of sin, and when God's forgiveness and his blood, as it were, applied to our lives by asking for forgiveness, we find that death is no longer a part of our life. Now, we die physically, but we'll never die spiritually. So six days before Passover festival, Jesus went to Bethany. That is where Lazarus lived and the man, the, the man that Jesus raised from the dead. Verse 2, they were there having dinner with Jesus, Mary and Martha. Martha served the food, and Lazarus was one of the people eating with Jesus. So... You can, again, you're reading between the lines at this one because I just think of the mood that would be in that, around that table. Now, they're not sitting on chairs and at a table like we're at. Their their tables are perhaps a foot off the ground or 12 inches, 18 inches off the ground. And they're reclining on pillows and they're reclining at the table and their feet are away from the table, all right? So the mood around the table, I, I'm imagining is kind of a little bit festive in the sense that I know that Passover is coming, but just a few days prior to this, Lazarus, who was dead, is now alive, 
and he's there at the meal. He's there with Jesus and the disciples. So I imagine that there's a kind of a confident assurance and underlying confidence in Jesus and about what's going on in their life and things are going pretty good. You know, they, we know that there's some opposition. We know that the religious leaders are, are very much against Jesus. But there's just this sense, wow, if he can raise someone from the dead, and we've seen the other miracles that he has performed, wow, there's, um, there's some real possibilities here. So, but Jesus was also, this was his farewell visit. He came to take leave of them, and leave them with words of comfort against the day of trial that was coming. So Jesus was not taken off guard by what was going to happen in the next few weeks, excuse me, the next few days. Um, Verse 3 says, Mary brought in a pint of expensive perfume made of pure nard. She poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. And when then she wiped his feet with her hair, and the sweet smell from the perfume filled the whole house. You know, as we look at these things, these individuals, um, and and see the situations around them, remember the uh, title is, Sirs, We Would See Jesus, that we would see how we understand Christ, that we would have our own revelation, insight into who Jesus is. We have Lazarus, and I think of Lazarus as the one who has gone through the trials, the individual who has bore the burden and the brunt brunt of sickness and illness and has died, but Jesus has risen him from the dead. Now, we are, in, in that story, we often say about how that the family had a healing in mind that Jesus had a resurrection. So Lazarus died. We have Martha. Her understanding and her revelation of a word of Jesus is a, a revelation of serving. Because prior to this meeting, you know, Jesus, this was his, his three closest friends outside of the disciples is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Jesus had been at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home just a few weeks prior, and we have that story where Martha's in the kitchen <laughs> getting dinner ready, and Mary's sitting at his feet listening, and, and G- Martha comes out and says, Jesus, tell Mary to get back here and help me. <laughs> and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things. Mary has chosen the better thing. Well, I think of Mary as the person who is anointed or sees herself as a person who is serving and taking care of. But Mary, Mary is a person who her revelation is one of worship. Her, hers is one of her heart and, and, and of insight. Because Mary brought in this expensive perfume, and she pours this oil, as it were, on his feet. Remember we said about the lamb that they would anoint the ankles as, uh, that with oil in case they had been bruised or so on on the rocks that they had been climbing on, the lamb. Well, I, we know that it was customary for people whenever they would enter into a home that the lowest slave had the, the duty of washing all the visitors' feet. And whenever they would come in and they would have this water, they would put like one or two drops of perfume in the water to make it kind of like a fragrance so that whenever they washed people's feet, there would be a, a, a fragrance of that perfume. Well, Mary took upon herself the form, as it were, the personage of a, the lowest servant. And now Jesus also said, he that is greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. And Mary has chosen this idea or this insight of worship. And she takes this oil and she just dumps it on his, pours it on his feet and his ankles. And she puts this oil, as it were, washing his feet with this oil that is worth a year's wages. 
And then she takes her hair and she seemingly dries or picks up the excess of the oil that is on his feet. This oil that Mary um, has for Jesus is perhaps her own burial oil. Because they were, when they buried, they would, they would perfume the body. They would do things to keep down the stench, as it were, of the decay. And so it was not uncommon for them to put these perfumes and things in the, in the tomb and on the body of the person who is deceased. Well, I think of Mary's revelation of worship. For how did she know? How did she know that you know, Jesus, in a few moments, tells her that this is, this is a preparer for my, preparing for my own burial, but Mary somehow knows that the, in this moment she's got to do this. And in this action of hers, it is a worship from her to, to Jesus. Now, a generous love that must be brought out to honor Christ. So this is her revelation of understanding of Jesus. You know, when we think of our own revelation, you know, sometimes we put um, our revelation of Jesus in a position where it's, it's, it's centered around some, some church or some ritual that doesn't mean anything, and we get caught up with the mistakes and flaws of people, and we somehow walk away from who Jesus is. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to walk away from who Jesus is. There is a revelation of who Jesus is needs to come to our own minds and hearts. And we need to put aside those things that would cause us to be offended at Christ. That which was poured on his feet was, the excess was wiped by her hair. It was an exceptional gesture of love for him. The, sa- the sacredness of this time with Jesus, knowing that and what Jesus had done for them, perhaps she in her heart was still going over. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, Jesus never held that against them. It's just that they didn't see what he was doing and what he was going to do. And I think in our own lives, there is this understanding, you know, we're going with this virus and all the, there's this, we don't know what's going on. And so it makes us very uneasy. It makes us very anxious at times. But our anxiousness needs to have its own revelation of who Jesus is. And that revelation brings us comfort. And as we worship him, as we go about our business of doing for others, as we have seemingly suffered through perhaps our own anxieties and and despair, Jesus comes to Lazarus and raises him. He gives strength to Martha for the doing. He gives an understanding revelation to Mary to pour this perfume upon the feet of Jesus. Well, you know, When you have something very beautiful and something very wonderful, you know, it's like Judas, (laughs) one of Jesus' followers was there, the one who would later hand Jesus over to the enemies. Judas says, that perfume was worth a year's pay. It should have been sold and the money should have been given to the poor. (laughs) There's always one in the crowd, right? Something wonderful is going on and there's somebody else who comes in and thinks they have to bring it back to reality. You know, we can't have this going on. So, kind of reminds me of the people who find fault with everything, you know. Doesn't matter if the sun is shining. Well, you know, it's probably going to rain. You know, it's raining, probably going to flood. You know, it's it's terrible downpour. Well, you know, where it's going to disasters coming. You know, one foot in the grave and one on the banana peel. So, But Judas, he did not really care about the poor. See, it was part of Judaism to care for the poor. But it was also part of Judaism to anoint the body. And Jesus um, 
defended Mary by balancing the care for the poor, that which is an ongoing concern. You know, because Judas, he didn't, he didn't say this to help the poor, you know? He was, he was bringing this, he wanted the money to go in his own bag so he could steal it and he could use it for his own gain. So he wasn't looking out for the poor, he was just looking for a way to add to who he was and take away from what Mary was doing. So <laughs> Jesus answered, don't stop her. It was right for her to save this perfume for today. She had been saving it, but for her own death, and burial, perhaps. But it was, it was right for her to save this perfume for today, the day for me to be prepared for burial. I mean, this is, you know, what a shockwave that sent through the crowd, the group. My burial. You will always have those who are poor with you, but you will not always have me. So you see, the poor where an ongoing concern, care for the dead by nature, is an immediate concern. Both categories are good deeds and were valued in Judaism, but Ju Judas was using one over the other just to line his own pockets. Many of the Jews heard that Jesus was, no, we change, we change scenes. The theme is revelation of Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Many of the Jews heard that Jesus was in Bethany. So when they were there to see him, they also went there to see Lazarus, the one Jesus raised from the dead. We come to Christ because we've heard of him. We're kind of like this crowd. We come to Jesus. Somebody has, you've heard of his name and therefore heard of Christ and you read the scriptures or you go to church or you, you know, have some banting of that in your mind. But the idea is we come to Jesus because we've heard of something. <laughs> About Lazarus. You know, we've heard God do miracles. Yeah, kind of put that down. We don't really go to church to, because we don't believe in miracles. We don't believe in that kind of stuff. Well, you see, God has given to every one of us a measure of faith. We choose where we will invest our faith. In belief of God or unbelief. In the goodness of what is going to happen and being positive and going forward with life or in doubt and criticism and tearing somebody down. We believe in destroying our fellow man. We believe in helping our fellow man. It's a belief system. We believe in prayer. What well, it means we are we believe that we can ask God and He hears us, but I don't believe He answers. <laughs> you see how our belief system plays into every part of who we are as a person. We believe that someone loves us. We we speak to them in, in, in a tone and in, in a love. We believe that someone hates us and we have another belief system in the way it works. It's interesting that the blind religious leaders, the blind religious leaders, this group, they didn't care about their religion, they cared about their position. And Jesus, whenever he healed the blind man in the temple, the religious leaders, they threw the guy out of the synagogue. They didn't want him there. They did not permit him to bear witness to Christ so that people would hear about Jesus. They didn't want that to happen, and so they threw him out of the synagogue. And we also have here that, so the leading priest, verse 10, made plans to kill Lazarus, too. You see, they were so blind by their religion but their religion wasn't about God. Their religion was about themselves. And there are religions that are about the people who stand there and talk or whatever. And there are, I don't say religions, but people. But for the most part, there is, there is an honest desire for people to know more about Christ. And these individuals that 
are <laughs> looking at Jesus and seeing all the people following Jesus and following to go and see Lazarus so that they could see Jesus, these religious leaders decided we need to kill Lazarus too. Not only, we, we have to get rid of the evidence that he can do something more than just what he's been doing. Verse 11. Because of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were leaving them. This is talking about the religious leaders. And they were believing in Jesus, and that is why they wanted to kill Lazarus. <laughs> the next day, verse 12. The people in Jerusalem heard that Jesus was coming there. These were crowds of people who had come to the Passover feast. So this Passover feast is now, and the center of it, of course, is Jerusalem. And whenever they were coming, the crowds were coming, they were coming there because they had heard about Jesus and his raising Lazarus from the dead. And this is the Palm Sunday declaration in which this international celebration of Jewish gatherers who had come from all over the then known world to Jerusalem. They had heard of Jesus and they had heard of his miracles and some of them had heard him teach. And verse 13 says, and they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet Jesus and they shouted, praise him, welcome. God bless those who come in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. And, you know, that's what they laid on the road, their cloaks and so on, they laid on the road. And Jesus, he found a donkey, cult of a donkey, meaning that this was a young donkey that had not been ridden on before, and he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. He fulfilled the scripture that says, Don't, Do not be afraid, people of Zion. Look. Your king is coming. He is riding on a young donkey. And there are 18 separate Old Testament prophetic um, declarations about Jesus and about his birth and his life and his, his riding into Jerusalem and his death on the cross and his accusers spitting on him and beating him and not one bone would be broken and all these prophetic things about who Jesus is and not one of these prophecies was left unfulfilled. Verse 16. The followers of Jesus did not understand at the time what was happening. But after he was raised to glory, they understood that this was written about him. Then they remembered that they had done these things for him. And I think of this as for ourselves, that we do not understand the reason for what happens in our life, in our community, in our world. We don't know the purpose and how and when and all those things. But we do know that there will come an end to it, and as we look back over it, it isn't that we'll be able to find a reason, but perhaps we can understand that in this whole thing, we drew our attention back to Jesus, or more fully upon him. Because, sirs, we've come to see Jesus. And that is kind of the focus of this message, and I think of this text, that we have come to see Jesus. We've come to have a revelation, have a better understanding that Jesus loves us and that he has a purpose for our life and that no matter what we face, God is with us. Verse 17. There were many people with Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead, and told him to come out of the tomb. Now they were telling others about what Jesus did. <laughs> Would we listen? Challenge to our own heart. Would we listen if somebody said this to us at this time period? Would we listen? Beca but we, you see, it was different for them. They believed that there was a Messiah coming. They believed that God had promised them something. And they were looking for it. Indirectly, indirectly, they were looking for it. The religious leaders, they were looking for a Messiah, but they wanted a Messiah to come to them to get permission to be the Messiah. And Jesus didn't fit their requirement. And for us, 
we want a revelation, uh, an understanding of what Jesus has come to do. 18. That is why so many people went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign he did. <laughs> they had heard. So the Pharisees said to each other, Look, our plan is not working. The people are all following him. You see, their plan to discourage and discredit and stop Jesus from gaining favor with the people, it wasn't working. So they were going to have to try even harder to get rid of him. And so their plans and their schemes are coming together for the next couple days. And they were going to succeed in taking his life, but they were able to succeed only because Jesus gave them permission to, because he knew who he was. He is the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He is the blood of the Lamb that would wash sin from our soul. Verse 20. There were some Greeks there too. These were some of the people who went to Jerusalem to worship at the Passover festival. They went to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said, Sir... We want to meet Jesus. Sir, we want to see Jesus. In this case, it was almost like seeing is believing. But the believing and the seeing was more revealing. That they were wanting God, they were wanting Jesus to be revealed to them because they were in hopes of something greater than what they had been planning or what they thought. Because if you read the, 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 the text, if you read the, the Jewish people, their history, we know of Abraham and Isaac and how that they were led by God. And then we know of them being taken out of Egypt by Moses and going in the wilderness and conquering the promised land. There's all of these miracles. And these Greeks who were believers in Judaism, they wanted to know, they wanted a revelation. They wanted an understanding of Jesus, is he really their Messiah? Sir, we want to meet Jesus. We, want not, we do not want to be like the religious leaders who look at Jesus and look at what he does and throw him out because it doesn't fit what we believe God to be, you know. Disbelief that he really can't be risen from the dead. You see, they threw out the healed blind man. They were willing to kill Lazarus. And they were knowing that they had to stop all of the good things that Jesus was doing because he was messing up their whole system. So this is the time and this is the place where our revelation of Jesus Christ comes to us. Yes, it is Palm Sunday. It is a Sunday in which these individuals laid the palm branches and laid their coats upon the, wall, upon the donkey and upon the trail where the donkey was riding into Jerusalem, and they're crying, Hosanna. It was a revelation because they had heard what Jesus had done and they, it, of raising Lazarus from the dead, and they had come to say, wow, magnificent Messiah, the God come be with us. And in our life, we have a virus. In our life, we have doubts and fears of perhaps from what has come in the past, but we need to be aware that God is with us now. And we can be like Martha, which is good. We are recognizing our call, our revelation to serve. We can be like Lazarus, one who has taken on the brunt of illness, sickness, and died. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but taking on the brunt of the, the activities and problems, and yet he's accompanied by Jesus, and Jesus brings him through this. Or, I think, most of all, I think we need to be like Mary, who comes with what she has. Perhaps it was her burial 
ointment. The things that, the thing that we think would be the last straw that we would ever use or the last straw that would break, break us and bring that to Jesus and lay it at his feet. And as we anoint him with our perfume and anoint him with our worship, we would find that the fragrance of his spirit would fill our lives. Not the fragrance of the ointment, but the fragrance of the spirit. I remember my grandma used to talk about, in, she was, sometimes was a preacher and would hold services. And she talked about being in services where there would be such a presence of God that there would be this aroma, this perfume that would just come and fill the entire sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, they would smell and feel and understand that where God was there with them. And I think in our own lives that there's this presence of God that comes to us. And he kind of surrounds us and lets us know that he loves us, he cares for us. And no matter if we're Mary, Martha, or even Lazarus, we're safe because God is with us. This is, sir, we would see Jesus. Reveal Jesus to us. Jesus, we thank you that you have heard our prayers. God, you know the need of our lives. And so we rest in your presence. We know that you care for us. And Lord, there may be those who are listening that are sick, going through the brunt of this illness. We pray, O oh God, that you will heal them and touch them. God, there are those who are busy working, those who are the front line of our care system. God, we pray that you would give them strength and guidance and protection as they go into their work each day and are taking on the responsibilities of caring for people. And God, there are those that, of us that we can be like Mary and we can worship you and praise you and that we can pray for those who are serving and those who are ill. So in our worship, O oh God, may we understand your calling upon our own life the revelation of Jesus Christ by your Holy Spirit to our own hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.